All right, folks, welcome to part two of A History of the Hare Krishna Religion. Stages six through 10, stage number six. If you haven't watched it, um, watch part one. It's Part one takes us from the Harappan <laughs> civilization, Bronze Age India, all the way to 1965. So it's a, it's a gallop through history, but I think it's a worthwhile one. Uh, these stages are all going to be a history of ISKCON uh, after it hits the Western world, so 1965 onwards. Uh, stage 6 is 1965 to 1967, the Hare Krishna explosion. Stage 7 is uh, 1977 to 87, the zonal Acharya system. Stage 8, contemporary ISKCON begins to take shape, late 80s and 90s. Stage 9, contemporary ISKCON, 2000s to the present. And stage 10. Uh, Hare Krishna goes right-wing nationalist, uh, which is present and beyond. Okay, so maybe you are familiar with some of this stuff, maybe more so than the previous video, but um, we'll try and give a, hopefully you'll find something interesting, I'll say that, in this phase. And if you're just coming in contact with the Hare Krishna religion, hopefully this will give you some sense of its history and uh, some of the things that happened in it. Um, some good? I don't know. Actually, I was going to say some good, some bad. I don't know if there's anything good in it. Um, I don't think any, you know, I think the world would absolutely be a better place if ISKCON never existed. I think most people's many lives were destroyed, derailed, and things like that. But hopefully it's just accurate. Good, bad, whatever the case is. Okay. Hare Krishna explosion. This was Prabhupada's life. I'm saying 19, uh, once he hit America, 1965 to 1977. It doesn't explode immediately when he arrives in India. Eventually he makes his way to the Lower East Side of New York. There things start to pick up steam uh, with the sort of remnants of the beatnik and the hippie movement that's sort of forming there uh, on the Lower East Side. Uh, he has some disciples who are like, you know, New York's not really where it's at. San Francisco is where it's at. That's where the second temple was started in San Francisco. Uh, not too long after that, uh, some devotees go to London, they meet the Beatles, they open a temple in London. So, uh, it, and it really kind of just snowballs from there with temples popping up in uh, major cities all across uh, the United States, England, uh, Europe, uh, eventually towards this later part, India, uh, South America as well, Mexico and other places in South America. So there is a pretty impressive um, growth of the Hare Krishna movement in this time. Of course, you know, devotees tend to um, think of this as some sort of evidence of its divine origin or divine destiny or something like that. But the truth is, of course, that cults of all kinds of varieties were uh, finding success in this period. Right. Um, people turn to fundamentalist religions in times of crisis, essentially. Uh, and this was a huge cultural revolution was happening in the 60s and 70s, a transition from this sort of Christian, uh, traditional American culture um, to whatever was coming after it, you know, women's rights, desegregation, secularism, right? All, you know, massive changes in society. Women were no longer just, you know, getting married in their early 20s and having kids and being supported by their husbands. They were going on to have careers or getting educations. Um, sexuality was no longer limited to marriage between birth control pill and abortion. Now sexuality is becoming a central part of uh, life and what it means to be a, a young person, to be a person. And so massive sort of cultural uh, shifts are happening. And most people are okay with that. Well, a lot of people are not okay with that and they sort of remain attached to the old power structures, the old ways. Um, some people are you know, eagerly moving into this new world. Some people kind of find themselves in between. And a lot of times those are the people that end up in cults. Um, maybe they don't feel a connection to the religion they grew up in, but they're not ready to fully embrace secularism. So they find an Eastern religion, things like that. So. Uh, Hare Krishna is kind of riding this cultural coattails, this huge cultural wave. It's surfing along. Um, ISKCON in this period, you know, they start out really just sort of 
collecting donations, like people who would visit the temple and they'd take that whatever little money they had. And, um, you know, in San Francisco, there was a devotee, Jayananda. He was driving a taxi and giving his money to the temple. It was very sort of, in the very early days, just kind of, uh, there wasn't a clear kind of method or way for the temples to support themselves. But pretty early on, uh, so the next phase is uh, chanting in the streets and collecting money. So they're you know going around with a ba begging bowl, basket, conch shell, something as they're chanting and people are maybe putting some money into it. Kind of the next phase, and this is sort of what dominates um, after the kind of the early 70s, is the distribution of books. So Prabhupada is busy dictating these books. They're being printed. Um, and they're being sold. So you have armies of people. So uh, what does ISKCON look like? So there's a temple. Everyone lives in the temple, pretty communal living. No one really has a lot of possessions, personal possessions. Um, you know, there's services people do. Some people clean, some people cook, some people take care of the, the deities. They do the religious services and the rituals, things like that. But the majority of people are uh, going out and selling books on the street. And uh, eventually this turns into a system where people would go out in vans and travel around and sell books and collect money that way. So this book distribution is a huge thing. It's the primary source of revenue for ISKCON. So if we're thinking about ISKCON as an organization, um, obviously how any organization gets money is one of its defining features. So how are the members living? How is the organization getting money, right? So <clears throat> members are living in the temple and also how are they raising children? These are some of the defining features of uh, ISKCON as an organization. And I guess you could add who's doing the initiating, how's the leadership happening. So in this early phase, Prabhupada is the guru. He's initiating everyone. Uh, the organization is getting money by selling books out of vans, traveling. Um, it's called San Kirtan. Um, everyone is living together and the children are being educated in boarding schools often in different cities, states, or even countries from their parents. Um, so many of the kids went to uh, schools, boarding schools in India, while their parents lived in America, collecting money for the organization. So if that doesn't scream cult to you, um, I don't know what to tell you, right? I mean, any group that separates the parents from their kids so the parents can go out and collect money for the organization, that's a cult, that's a cult. There's no two ways about it, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's a cult. Prabhupada was a cult leader. He had his followers collecting money for his organization while their children were languishing in boarding schools, suffering extreme mental abuse, extreme physical abuse, being beaten, uh, sleep deprived, all that stuff, not being fed properly, not being given uh, clothes and all that stuff, not being given proper education, and also rampant, rampant, rampant uh, sexual abuse, young children being raped repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. So child abuse, very prominent in this early phase of ISKCON's existence while Prabhupada was on the planet. Um, now you can talk about ideology or oh, the Gurukul system matches some ancient Indian system. Gurukuls didn't, you know, that wasn't a common thing. It wasn't like in Prabhupada's time in India kids were just sent to gurukuls. I mean, his he was raised by parents, right? I mean, that was... So, anyhow, the gurukul system was implemented and you could argue... And, you know, as were other things, like, oh, people living without possessions. There are various texts that support that notion. So people would say, members would say, oh, this is just what the religion demands of us. But there's a lot of different things in the tradition itself. And you could argue the Bhagavad Gita says people shouldn't live in temples and give up. What they should be doing is living outside and working for Krishna. Specific passages were emphasized, and these were the specific passages that um, allowed for the organization to turn its members into vehicles for collecting large sums of money, building temples. Uh, the Gurukul system allowed members to focus on putting all their time and energy into building the organization rather than raising their children, right? So all that stuff, very cultish. Now, 
um, contemporary Hare Krishnas would say, well, it's not actually a cult nowadays. It was a cult back then when you know kids were being sent off to boarding schools and people were out collecting money for the organization, but it's not really run that way now. Now it's different, it's not a cult now. Now people live at home and they raise their children, so that makes it not a cult. Uh, it was a cult then, <laughs> and it's a cult now. It's just a different kind of cult. Um, and we'll get to uh, why it's a cult now when we talk about the contemporary Hare Krishna religion. Okay, so that is stage six, um, Hare Krishna explosion. That was when Prabhupada was alive on the planet. Prabhupada dies in 1977. Okay, so you have this kind of fledgling organization. Everything is dependent on him. Everyone is devoted to him. Everything is organized around, you know, helping him build his temples and spread the religion around the world and helping him finish, you know, doing all this so he can finish his books, all that stuff. Um, okay, what comes after that? So Prabhupada dies, um, not exactly abruptly. He had gotten sick. So what it, the system that had been put in place towards the end of his life was, uh, so he put in a management system called the GBC or the Governing Body Commission, and that there were different zones, right? So the world was divided up into different sort of zones, um, managerial zones, and what came into existence toward the end of Prabhupada's life was uh, a zonal kind of authority system connected to the GBC system. Um, and there was a spiritual leader associated with each zone. And what happened is these spiritual leaders towards the end of Prabhupada's life when he wasn't able to travel around the world, um, these uh, zonal kind of spiritual authority figures were uh, performing initiations on behalf of Prabhupada. So, uh, by the end of his life, he was still initiating disciples, even though he couldn't leave or travel, but it was done by proxy or Ritvik. So these people were sort of performing the ceremony on his behalf, but uh, they were Prabhupada's disciples, at least in name. In practice, they were sort of under the authority structure of the, uh, the local kind of authority for the zone and the temple president, kind of the local power structure. Okay, so what Prabhupada says is, all right, I'm, you know, he leaves instructions. Uh, after I die, I want you guys to carry on as gurus in my absence. You know, you 11 people who have been doing these uh, initiations on my behalf, we're going to keep this going. Keep it rolling, but now you're going to be the gurus. Okay, so that is the introduction of the zonal acharya system. And... It lasts for 10 years. It is officially abolished in 1987 at a GBC meeting. So we got a nice 10 year round number phase. Um, a lot happens in this 10 year period, as you might imagine. It starts off kind of gangbusters really because people love cults. <laughs> That's the unfortunate truth. Humans, we love cults. We love to sort of give our power and authority over to someone else and say, you tell me what to do with my life, because that's a really heavy burden to carry. Like, how should I live? What should I do? And it's really nice if you can just be like, oh, here's this perfect person in this perfect group. Let me offload all that responsibility onto them. They can just tell me what to do. It feels very good. From an evolutionary perspective, it feels good to have a leader. You feel safe, you pr feel protected, right? We grew up in tribes. Tribes have leaders in the animal kingdom almost certainly in early human tribes, although they were very egalitarian, there were still elements of leadership and shamans and tribal elders and things like that. Feels good to be under the protection of a leader. Um, so these gurus very quickly sort of, each kind of zone turned into its own little cult of personality or big cult. Um, these, you know, Prabhupada, to his credit, uh, didn't have sex with any of his disciples, I and mean, he's pretty old, so maybe less of a temptation there. Um, and while he did live uh, comfortably, shall we say, he had you know personal servants who would give him a massage every day, and he had nice food, and his quarters were always nicer than um, you know the the, the typical temple dwelling. You know, so he had some luxuries. He had nice cars. He was traveled around nice cars, things like that. But he, you know, he didn't, you know, go around wearing diamond Rolexes and have collections of, you know, Mercedes Benzes and things like that, like 
you know, Osho or something. Um, so he, as far as gurus go, he kept a fairly low profile in terms of the way he dressed, the way, you know, his quarters, his jewelry, his clothes, things like that. Um, the, the zonal acharyas that came after him, not so much. They lived, uh, you know, so first off, the majority of them ended up having sex with uh, their followers, disciples, some men, some women. Um, some of them were involved in uh, child abuse, pedophilia. Uh, that would be you know, Bhapananda, Kirtananda. Um, so the zonal acharyas, I don't know if I can remember all of them off the top of my head, but some names. Kirtananda, Bhavananda, Jayapataka, Hridayananda, Ramesh, uh, Harikesh, uh, Tamal Krishna, Jayatirtha. All right, well, that was nine. Two more I'm missing. Um, so anyhow, a lot of these people were living. So, and then the other thing that happened, so the guru shifts from Prabhupada to these 11 people. You've got these cults of really intense cults of personality. They're accepting kind of more, more extravagant worship than Prabhupada. You know, the stories of uh, garlands of money, right? So in traditionally in India, the, the guru wears a garland of flowers, um, garlands of cash. <laughs> I think that was Bhavananda. Um, he had some pretty uh, rabid followings and lived very extravagantly in uh, castles in France and Italy. Um, lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, okay. So the economic base shifted from selling books, going out and traveling in vans, selling books to collect money to, you know, eventually devotees realize, well, this book stuff, you get money, but not quite as much money as if you just sell random shit. So. They developed, and they still called it Sankirtan. Sankirtan went from chanting in the streets to selling books in the streets to selling stickers and hats and things in the streets. So flowers. So they'd go up to someone, they'd give them a sticker, maybe a joke, make a joke, say we're collecting money for a charity, a food for life. Um, would you, can you give us some money or give us a donation? So collecting donations for charities with stickers and flowers and sometimes going to like uh, sporting events like NASCAR races in America and selling hats, uh, things like that. That also came, you know, Sankirtan. So in this phase of ISKCON, this sort of zonal acharya phase, and again, there's kind of an early one and a late one. The early part, so there's collection of money by selling random shit. There's these individual gurus, 11 of them, cults of personality, very extreme. Um, this is probably the phase where you know the craziest stuff happened. I mean, that early phase, absolutely horrific, crazy stuff happened to children, um, irregularly being just beaten, nearly to death, and raped, and just horrible stuff, being forced to like eat their own vomit, and just really nasty stuff happened to the children. And this next phase is when it gets sort of really culty in terms, and uh, a lot of wild stuff happens, uh, Jai Tirthas, down in Australia. I don't really honestly know much about him because he was down in Australia on the other side of the world. Didn't hear much about him, but I do know he was uh, taking LSD as a guru and eventually got his head chopped off um, in <laughs> New Vrindavan. Uh, you had Kiritananda who was having sex with young boys and sort of going off the deep end. He really thought that he was the next Acharya. So there's kind of this skirmish or a cold war to who's gonna kind of become the next one Acharya, the one guru to lead us Khan, Kirtananda and his followers really thought it was him because he was, you know, the oldest. He was older than the others. He was maybe more uh, disciplined, more strict. He was, you know, one of the original, the first sannyasi in his Khan, Prabhupada's original right-hand man. So there's maybe his preaching style was maybe most similar to Prabhupada's. So, uh, not surprising that his uh, followers thought of him that way. Uh, obviously, a lot of bad stuff happened in New Vrindavan. Um, in this period, there were a couple murders. Um, you know, these Sankirtan vans that were going out. Um, women were really good at this. So you would have a man going out with a group of women in a van and uh, essentially having sex with all of them, sexually abusing them or in some cases like polygamy, being married to all of them. So a lot of, you know, this period's kind of the the wild west of ISKCON and it kind of goes from this sort of fun, 
hippie thing in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. It's fun, it's light, it's expanding. We've got Prabhupada to kind of this really dark thing. Um, Prabhupada's gone. Now you have these other people who are really pretty young and they're uh, not shy about being worshipped and um, living extravagantly and having sex with their disciples. So eventually, one by one, you know, well, Jai Tirtha is killed, but uh, many of them, it turns out, uh, were having sex with their disciples. They fall down in ISKCON terms. They leave their position. So midway kind of through this, if we're taking this as a 10-year period, this it's kind of falling apart. The wheels are coming off. Um, it's just not really tenable. There's, you know, we gotta do something about this. Eventually it's abolished in 1987. Okay, so it kind of starts off, you know, fun hippie thing, kind of dark. And 1987 sort of the, the nadir of ISKCON in a lot of ways. It's sort of the dark night of ISKCON. Where do we go from here? What is ISKCON? Is it ever gonna recover? That's kind of really where we're at in the movie. The hero's journey. It does recover. Uh, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, the other thing that's worth saying um, that's happening in this period, people are start, you know, as this con, as the idealism of these people is wearing off, gradually gurus are falling down. It's like, I don't know, I want to live in the temple. I want to do my own thing. I want to have some freedom, some independence. I want to raise my children. So what's happening is the guru cool system is starting to kind of wind down a little bit and uh, people are starting to move out of the temples. So temples, A, have lost their financial base. You've got the members, like my parents, who are kind of trying to figure out their lives. And um, you know, people who grew up in it are now either maybe going to public school in some cases, or often in many cases, uh, they're going to a Hare Krishna school that's not a boarding school, but it is, you know, it's a day school. You go there in the day, it's a private school. You go back and spend the night with your parents. So, I was kind of in this transition generation where for the first four years of my education, I, I went to a proper Gurukul, which is kind of funny to me because I'm a exennial, which is the sort of middle generation that got electronics um, in their teenage years. So they weren't born into them. So in between sort of Gen X and millennial, they call this little micro generation exennial. So I think of the exennial generation as the generation of kids within ISKCON that went to Gurukul for the first part of their life, but then stopped going to Gurukul after that. And there's slight variation depending on where you were born and all that. Um, but for me, that's what's the case. I went to Gurukul for the first uh, four years of my education in a Gurukul boarding school in a community in Mississippi called New Taliban. Eventually we moved to Florida, Alachua, Florida, as did many people in America in the early 90s. And that community grew rapidly. Okay, so that's the other big shift that's happening in the 80s. People are moving out of temples. Um, it's, the temples are becoming less communal and more congregation-based. But the problem with the congregation-based models is uh, devotees are very poor because they don't have an education. They don't have work experience. They're sort of trying to figure this out on the fly and they don't have great options, to be honest. A lot of them are going out and selling things because that's what they used to do for the temples. Now they're doing that for themselves. Um, so the temples are kind of poor. Uh, it's the beginning of a new guru system. They authorize some new people to give initiation, things like that, right? So the gurus are expanding after this period, but it's kind of unclear where it's gonna go from there. Okay, so let's say it ends in 1987. We'll call that the nadir of ISKCON, kind of its lowest point. The zonal acharya system has collapsed. Temples are sort of collapsing in a way. Um, people aren't living there anymore. It's sort of not sure what direction ISKCON is gonna go. It is worth noting that in this period, in the 80s, uh, ISKCON is undergoing rapid expansion in the former Soviet Union, countries of the former Soviet Union. So kind of like we see in the Western world, it was going through its transition in the 70s, you know, late 60s, 70s, uh, kind of the Soviet, former Soviet Union was also going through a, a major cultural shift in that time and was therefore able to attract followers in that period. So ISKCON in America is sort of languishing, but it is uh, massively expanding in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, Russia, etc. 
Okay. Now, and it's also expanding in India. The, the, what's happening, you know, the, the major temples, Vrindavan, Mayapur, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Mayapur, they're established by the time of Prabhupada's death, but they're, they're picking up a lot of steam gradually in this period from like say 77 to 87 over that decade, but not really an explosion, but they're establishing themselves. Okay, so stage eight, contemporary ISKCON begins to take shape. And we're calling this stage, if you want to give an exact year, you know, 87 to 2000, you know, it's basically late 80s through the 90s. So this is when the contemporary kind of ISKCON that we know and love <laughs> uh, takes shape. What do I mean by that? Okay, so ISKCON does not really have a good option financially. It's gone from selling books, so it's gone from begging to selling books, to selling stickers and other things, to what comes next? Well, what comes next is Indian people. Indian people start, so these temples, gradually what's happened is as uh, devotees are leaving the temples, they're no longer residing there, another thing has kind of been sort of percolating, developing, is that these temples are developing congregations of Indians, right? So there's a, a fairly large Indian diaspora at this point, uh, especially you know, in the 90s with the kind of tech revolution, so a lot of software engineers, but you know, earlier generations of Indians were you know, a doctors and other things, professionals of various kinds. And uh, the Indian community had been uh, used for financial purposes prior to this time, and my, my father was very involved in, uh, you know, in the 70s and the early 80s. Um, well, this was probably in the early 80s, um, developing kind of a tourist, Indian tourism uh, at New Vrindavan. So that wasn't entirely new, but it had sort of just been developing in this period. So by the end of, you know, by the time we get to say the 90s, you've got these sort of temples that have congregations of Indian people. And this process really begins to accelerate in the 90s. So. Um, what you're now finding is temples' primary mode of support is coming from their congregations and mostly from the Indian people in those congregations because so the Western people, the Americans, A, they don't have very much money because they don't have careers, B, they're pretty fried, pretty burnt out. They don't want to give money. They've given their whole life at this point. So they don't really want to give money, but they also don't have much money to give either. So. Um, yeah, so that's a big shift that's happening. Uh, gurus, more and more gurus are uh, coming into existence. New ones are sort of rising to prominence. Kind of the, the most popular gurus of the 11, the original 11, some are still around, but they've kind of faded. They're not seen as the, the hot gurus. Um, importantly, uh, Radhana Swami is rising to prominence. Uh, I'd say importantly, because he's the kind of most famous popular guru in ISKCON right now. So he, his kind of rise to fame. He basically was in New Vrindavan, and then in the 80s, as New Vrindavan was falling apart, he was hiding in India. Many people say, uh, and I think there's good evidence, to say that he was involved in the, one of the murders, and therefore that's why he was spending time in India, letting that kind of boil That's the right word expression I'm looking for, laying that blow over, that storm kind of blow over. He starts coming back to America, starts traveling, gaining a following outside of India in the 90s and up into the early 2000s when he really sort of takes over, you might say. Um, okay, um, so we've got an economic shift from collecting money to Indian congregations, people, you know, the sort of the, the diaspora out of the temple is complete. Pretty much everyone's living outside of temples. You've got the rise of Radhanath Swami, sort of related to the rise of Radhanath Swami, but not limited to, is the real rise of ISKCON in India. It's really starting to pick up steam now in India. And from the 90s onwards, 90s, the aughts, 2010s, the real growth in ISKCON has been with Indian people. And kind of like America in the 60s and 70s, like Russia in the 80s, 
India is going through its own sort of transformation, its own economic transformation, um, its own move kind of towards secularism, becoming a part of the global economy. But many people, there's you know a backlash, a fundamentalist backlash to that. And a lot of those people, it's confusing when your culture is changing and you don't know what to do and how to live. And some of those people embrace fundamentalism and that's what we see what's happening uh, in India. Uh, the other big thing that's happening in this period um, in the 90s is uh, the rise of uh, the Gaudiya Mutt. Uh, so Narayan Maharaj is starting to gain followers. There's you know, Tripurari Swami who had left to follow Sridhar Swami. He becomes his own kind of Gaudiya Mutt. There's other followers of Sridhar Swami. Um, so the, ISKCON is not the only option when it comes to Gaudiya Vaishnavism in the West beginning in this period in the 90s. And I think that sort of picks up into the 2000s and beyond uh, these other uh, organizations, especially uh, Narayan Maharaj, but also the Tripurari Swami's organization uh, become, uh, f find themselves, I don't know, whatever. They get more power and more followers. Um, the other big thing that happens in this period in the 90s is, you know, people are pretty disillusioned by, you know, all right, the zonal charya system failed. You know, ISKCON in the early 90s, it's kind of like, what is it really? People are disillusioned, people are frustrated, people are angry, what did I give my life for? And what we see is a rise of sort of conspiracy theories in ISKCON. And um, one of them was the idea that Prabhupada was poisoned, poisoned by Tamal Krishna because he, you know, they wanted to be guru and kind of connected to the poison thing was the Ritvik thing, which is, this was uh, the idea that Prabhupada didn't want anyone to be a guru after him. He thought what Prabhupada wanted was for all subsequent gurus to be Ritviks, to initiate on his behalf. Um, and then also uh, editing conspiracies. So Tamal Krishna uh, is a villain of uh, the sort of poison conspiracy. Uh, Jai Dweda is the villain of the editing conspiracy. Uh, to be clear, I don't think there was a poisoning of Prabhupada. I don't think there was any malicious intent in terms of editing his books. I think the editors generally did a good job. And I don't uh, think that Prabhupada wanted Ritviks. I think Prabhupada clearly wanted uh, gurus in his place to come after him. So I think all those conspiracies are ill-founded and there's no evidence for them. But, you know, uh, I understand why people looked to them because shit went wrong and people needed someone to blame. People need some explanation for why this special thing that they thought was going to take over the world had sort of run out of gas, had stalled, and, you know, led them into a dead end and their life left them languishing, things like that. Okay. So that's stage eight, which I've called contemporary ISKCON begins to take shape. Whew, almost there, folks, almost there. Stage nine, contemporary ISKCON. So now we've, we've arrived, we've arrived. Contemporary ISKCON, 2000s to the present. So what do I have here? Um, ISKCON being fully supported and in many cases, uh, sorry, taken over. You know, I never had any problem with Indian people. There was a lot of uh, American devotees, to be honest, who didn't like the Indianification or the Hinduification of ISKCON with, you know, it's just racism. Um, I always thought that was, must be Krishna's plan. So I never had a problem with it. But, uh, you know, Indian devotees are starting to really play prominent roles in very important temples uh, around the world, really. So you get this real kind of um, rise to power and influence of the Indian congregations and Indian devotees within those congregations, uh, people who can collect money from Indians, you know, Indian devotees who are good at collecting money from Indians, gurus who are good at speaking to Indians, uh, Indian devotees, you know, Indian devotees who are good at ministering to Indian congregations and converting them and getting them to uh, give money, right? So this, the, and this is, and obviously my perspective is somewhat limited to what's happening in America, the UK, and uh, India, and specifically uh, Mumbai, India, and Radha Gopinath Mandir, because that's kind of the world that I was most familiar with. Um, 
so obviously things were happening in South America and Mexico and you know Russia that I'm not China Japan that I'm not in on and all the details but I think the power axis of ISKCON is kind of this uh, America UK Mumbai kind of along with the rest of India uh, power axis in my opinion uh, in terms of cultural shifts things like that okay um, so what's happening? All right, so we've got this you know, transition to being fully supported by Indians. We've got this transition to being fully supported uh, to congregations, devotees, almost living exclusively. You know, temples might have a couple of brahmacharis. Every temple has, you know, two or three brahmacharis. You know, in the early 2000s, there's a few brahmachari ashrams. Like, you know, there's one in, San in America. There's like, you know, there's one in LA. There's one in San Diego with a handful of brahmacharis in each. There's New Vrindavan with like three brahmacharis. There's the New York, the Bhakti Center with like five brahmacharis. But that's kind of like very limited people living in temples at this point in time. And I assume it's something still like that. Um, so I think the, the defining feature of this era is what I call full cult mode activated. Um, or it's the professionalization of ISKCON, the professionalization of ISKCON's outreach. So in this period, we start to see things, you know, recruitment of people using things like informational seminars, like, oh, here's a seven-day course on the Bhagavad Gita, right? And even more cultish, here's a course on management. Here's a course, you know, how to be a good manager. Here's a course on stress management. Here's a course on meditation. Uh, in the kind of New Zealand, um, Australia side of the world, you've got these things. Devamrita Swami has these things called mantra lounges he's doing. In America, under the guidance of Radna Swami, we're doing uh, vegetarian cooking classes and sort of related things, and that was something I was a part of. You've got the Bhakti Center in New York, which is trying to be kind of mantra lounge-ish, has a vegetarian restaurant and yoga classes and seminars, stuff like that. Um, yoga classes, devotees becoming certified as yoga instructors, opening yoga centers, teaching yoga classes. You have the rise of kirtan within ISKCON and kirtan festivals. So that was something I was a big part of um, and was there for. We had these early kind of festival of inspirations in New Vrindavan, which morphed into the 24-hour kirtan festivals. Shout out to a uh, friend who's no longer with us, Nitai, one of the organizers of that very first Kirtan festival. Um, you know, and kind of concomitant with that was the rise of Radna Swami in America. Radna Swami's Gurukuli disciples like Gauravani and his disciples in New York like Ananta and people like Madhava, as well as kind of rise to prominence of Aindra and the 24 hour Kirtan party. Um, you're also getting the sort of emergence of these different youth groups. So now it's going from just converting people to kind of uh, bringing in young people who grew up in it. So in America, you have uh, bus tours and uh, being, so in the early days, there was a Gurukuls and then there were Gurukulis and they went to Gurukul. And we had Gurukul reunions and these were essentially parties. <laughs> I grew up seeing them. I was younger in the older generation. I was like, whoa, these are cool. Like, Gurukulis get together and they smoke weed and drink and party and listen to music and probably have sex too. This is cool stuff. Um, eventually, the Gurukuli reunions shifted into sort of these being managed by Gurukulis who had kind of converted uh, at various stages in various ways. Um, Manu, who was running these bus tours, so there were early Gurukuli bus tours, which were just a bunch of kids riding around partying, to these very managed experiences in which the goal was to make them more Krishna conscious. And obviously there's no drinking or smoking. They were going around to Rathiatras around the country and doing performances. So the Gurukuli culture in America is really shifting, and I was one of the early kind of forerunners of that, along with a handful of other people in Florida and, and DC and New York, things like that. Um, you also have in the UK, you've got the Pandavasena, which is sort of this Indian youth group, second generation slash Indian youth group, very closely connected to Radhanath Swami and some of the programs that are happening in the Radha Gopinath temple there. So 
um, there's kind of a, so you've got a professionalization of outreach, you've much like kind of type of stuff that sort of Christian youth groups would do to sort of bring their congregation, bring the, their uh, youth in, youth, youth pastoring, youth mentoring, um, to try and sort of convert them, to bring them into the organization. And largely successful. Culture is very different now than it was for those who grew up in it, now than it was when I uh, was growing up in it. Uh, also in this period, you've got Radha Gopinath Temple in Mumbai, and it's sort of um, satellite centers, Pune, or the original one, and then you know a gazillion spread out from there. Uh, you've got the Ritvik uh, people in Bangalore, and you got the beginning of these, uh, I think, the midday meal program. I think that's what it's called in Radha Gopinath Temple. Uh, it's called, I think the Bangalore version is called something else. Um, so ISKCON India is sort of professionalizing and doing these things. You've got the, the Bhaktivedanta Hospital. So opening hospitals, uh, giving out like hundreds of thousands of meals. Uh, collecting money to do that, right? So these are revenue generating enterprises that also generate a lot of goodwill, a lot of publicity. And then you've got, you know, the professionalization of outreach in India, which largely originated with Radha Swami and the Radha Gopinath Temple. You know, when I went there, it was, uh, you know, early 2000s, you know, Gorgo Paul was a regular preacher, you know, although there was definitely an emphasis on presentation and style now he has a you know facebook group with who god knows how many people on it facebook page god knows how many people watch it and you could not even tell he's a devotee he's just telling these random anecdotes like literally nothing to do with the Hare krishna philosophy but indian people seem to eat up with the spoon which honestly i love you indian people but i don't know why you <laughs> you're good-hearted people i guess you're really good people and i guess that's why you like people like Gorgo Paul who present drivel, absolute drivel to you. Although to be fair, you've got someone like uh, the UK Indian person whose name I can't remember, um, who has a really famous uh, podcast called On Purpose, uh, Jay Shetty. So I guess it's not just Indian people, people like mindless drivel with very little intellectual content that makes them feel good. So. I don't know, cults weaponize that. Anyhow, so I think that's the contemporary ISKCON. And the funny thing is to me, if you were to bring back, you know, Prabhupada from the 70s and plop him down, I think he'd be absolutely furious. Like kirtan festivals, devotees singing kirtan while people do yoga, devotees going to yoga festivals to do kirtan, devotees pretending to be management consultants. You know, Prabhupada collecting money for various things, you know, taking payment. A lot of this stuff that contemporary ISKCON does, Prabhupada would have blasted. He would be absolutely livid if he saw it. Now, the thing about Prabhupada was he sort of didn't have a whole lot of fixed ideology. You know, at first it was sell books and then it's like, oh, books aren't working in India. Don't do that. Uh, do this other thing, right? Prabhupada was very, um, Utility is the principle, <laughs> but, you know, he was very flexible and, you know, he was willing to basically do whatever it took to spread the religion. Uh, if something wasn't working, he would try something else. So ultimately, if this changes would have happened gradually and say the original Prabhupada was still alive, I think he probably would have gone along with them. Um, but if you were to import, you know, time travel, bring the old Prabhupada into con contemporary times, I don't think he would love everything that's happening in ISKCON. Anyhow, okay, so where does ISKCON go from here? Stage 10, Hare Krishna goes right-wing nationalist is what I'm calling it. So this is more a predictor, predicting it, the future. Uh, so this is present and beyond. So make what you will of it. Uh, so I think um, this is a very interesting Facebook page, which I have liked and I see the things they post. Uh, it's called Discover Hare Krishna, obviously run by Indians. And um, they posted something that said, Hindus are a tax block, minorities are a vote block. Is it minorities or Muslims? I can't remember. Vote block. So 
this, when I saw this, absolutely blew my mind. And it was not like I wasn't aware of this attitude and I've been seeing this coming because I've seeing the signs of fascism and right-wing extremism rising all over the world. So I've been kind of paying attention to that. So I've seen it happening in ISKCON as well. So the idea that ISKCON would post something extremely racist, racist and uh, fundamentalist and nationalist and fascist, not surprising, but just how similar it was to American politics, that was surprising, right? That is the exact strategy Republicans have used for, you know, since the, the 80s, since Reagan to essentially kick Democrats' ass and um, cut taxes and, you know, push along their agenda cut taxes on the wealthy, cut social services, using this racism. And that's exactly what this meme was saying. It was just a summary of the Republican strategy. Label minorities as lazy, label them as takers, label the majority group, in this case Hindus, in our American case it's the white people, as the hardworking Americans who are paying our fair share of taxes, and you've got these minorities and they're just freeloading off us taxpayers. Wow. So. Um, so here's what I see for the future of ISKCON. I think uh, ISKCON will continue to embrace Hindu nationalism in India. I mean, that just seems obvious. Um, I think ISKCON will continue to become more ethnically Indian uh, with the majority of the next generation of gurus being Indian because even with this sort of shift to yoga and kirtan and bhakti lounges and all that stuff, I mean, that was an attempt to attract new people because ISKCON wasn't attracting new people. I don't see that new people are joining ISKCON en masse in any way that could really sustain it. So what I see is uh, ISKCON will continue to uh, service Indian populations outside of India and will gradually become more and more ethnically Indian. Um, I don't know the details of Indian politics. I know that the current sort of ruling powers are Hindu nationalists and fascistic in their tendencies. I don't know what alternatives there are in India. I don't know if those alternative groups will be successful. So I can't comment and I, too much on the future of ISKCON because I think in a lot of ways, the future of ISKCON depends on the future of Indian politics, which I don't know enough about to comment on. Um, so, I mean, what we're sort of seeing is some kind of, on the one hand, the sort of yoga scene people, primarily white, um, on the other hand, what we're seeing is sort of the Indian version of ISKCON. Some of it very right wing in India, some of it, you know, somewhere in between, you know, in terms of temples in America. Uh, who wins out between these people? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, questions, you know, will ISKCON split? I think that's a tricky one and a hard one to imagine um, because the, the more liberal group is going to have to uh, justify its beliefs. Now, I think maybe the splinter group, if, if ISKCON does split, I think it's going to go like this. I think the splinter group is going to be the right-wing extremist group, right? Because the le for the left-wing group to split off, the liberal group to split off, they'd have to find some sort of scriptural justification to do that, you know, some sort of justification in Prabhupada's teachings, right? So I have to say those people over there, they're not following the real teachings. It, it actually is supposed to be like this. And, and maybe it's as simple as, look, those people over there are pursuing an ethnic version of ISKCON, but ISKCON is not supposed to be ethnic. It's supposed to be a religion that transcends all sort of cultures. And maybe that's enough of a justification. If there is a split, I think it's more likely India and the rest of the world or some portion of India or some some right-wing version. Um, but the, the interesting thing about ISKCON is it doesn't necessarily have to split officially because you just have gurus that can sort of uh, exist and gurus that can be very different, right? You've got say someone like Bhaktivikas Swami versus someone like Radhanath Swami, two very different gurus, very different flavors. Uh, one sexist, <laughs> one a little bit less so. Um, I'm not going to say anyone in ISKCON is not sexist because by definition, if you preach the philosophy, if you embrace the philosophy, you are sexist, uh, but less overtly so. Less, you know, women have to be in the kitchen sort of sexism. More women are by nature suited to serve men and raise children, but not all women, just most. Okay. Okay.
Okay, I think we've really come to the end of our two-part history of the Hare Krishna religion. Hopefully you've gained some insight into what it is. Um, what are some of the takeaways after close to two hours here of talking about this? I mean, I think obviously the big takeaway should be, look, it's just another religion. It functions like every other religion. It incorporates elements of the culture over time. Disparate elements fuse into one coherent whole. What you find is disparate elements vying, and then you find an authoritative text. Boom, the Gita. It kind of solidifies things, and that becomes the new baseline. New disparate elements. After the Gita was the baseline, and you've got this Radha Krishna thing coming in. Boom, Srimad Bhagavatam, new baseline. Um, now from there, disparate elements, Chaitanya, Radha Krishna, you know, boom, Chaitanya Charitamrita, new baseline. Even just looking at the history of ISKCON, you know, everyone has to live in the temple. If you're not living in the temple, you're Maya, you're this, you're that. And in that first period, the Hare Krishna explosion phase, it was not okay to live outside the temple. I think if you weren't there, if you're not familiar, like, you were in Maya if you lived outside the temple. You were rejected by the group. To be a member in good standing, you had to live in the temple. Now in many places, it's like, no, you can't live in the temple. We literally do not have a place for you. And also, that's not the right way to be a devotee. So just within the past few decades, we've seen a massive shift in uh, orthodox kind of practice of ISKCON, right? Religions are constantly changing. Religions exist to serve us and to serve our needs. We create religions to serve our needs. We create religions to serve our needs for certainty about our place in the world, to serve our needs for community, to serve our needs to have a, a moral kind of foundation, to give our, our lives meaning and purpose, right? Religions serve all these different needs. And needs change because culture changes and the, the situation people find themselves in change. So religions have to constantly change and adapt over time to meet the needs of the people. Otherwise, religions die, right? Some religions fade out because they weren't able to meet the needs of uh, people. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, you know, the other big takeaway from me, you know, thinking about um, this transition from literally like po immediate post-Vedic phase almost 3,000 years ago to now, Krishna has won out, right? Krishna <laughs> Krishna beat out a, a lot of other uh, traditions. Um, so I think it's a good story, right? I mean, in the early phase, you had Shiva Puranas and Shakti Puranas, and certainly there are Shiva temples and, you know, but the Krishna story really ultimately won out. I mean, the story of the Mahabharata, the story of the Ramayana, these are powerful stories. And there's something in it that even speaks to humans today. And that's that's pretty impressive. It's a really, it's a good story. Um, the, the Radha Krishna thing that comes in is like, wow, it really turns a lot of religion on its head in a powerful way. It's, it's, there's a lot of interesting kind of things going on in this story. It's been successful. It's, it's evolved over time. It's been successful. And um, it continues to do so. So I think that's, that's kind of fascinating in a lot of ways. All right, folks. We done. 53 minutes in. Part two. Part two. Part one was almost an hour. Like I said, I hope you've learned something. Uh, like I said, you know, like I always say, you know what to do to support the channel. Like the video. Subscribe. Leave a comment. Um, there's other ways to support down below, affiliate links and such like that. As always, thanks for watching. Uh, if I have not heard from you, I would be happy to do so. Hit me up on one of my social media accounts below. We can chat sometime. That's always fun meeting new people. Uh, know that you're not alone in this journey. If you're trying to figure out what the hell this Hare Krishna thing is and how you got involved in it and what it means that you got involved in it and how you put your life back together, maybe after it's kind of fallen apart, all that stuff. I've been there, many other people have been there, so you're not alone. I'd be happy to talk to you or put you in touch with other people who are also going through some similar stuff. All right, my friends, as always, thank you so much. I love you all. Bye-bye.